So quick question, how many of you are feeling like you're working on the exact right thing you need to be doing right now to grow your business? It's a lot more hands than I expected. <laughs> See if this works. When we started off, when you started off, you had a single idea. Things were much more simple back then. You had a vision, you focused all of your attention to get that, to, to see it through, right? Maybe by yourself or with a co-founder. Focused everything to just make it, to make that product, to get it to where it needs to go. And you did, because you're sitting here because now it's grow time. And by the mostly lack of hands, I can see that things are getting a lot more challenging. And it's a lot, it's a daily struggle to really know that you're working on the exact right things. So before I get started, I have to give you a little bit of a backstory. We are a mom and pop shop. Uh, I run the business with Chris, who's my husband. He started it 16 years ago, which definitely makes us senior citizens in the software industry. Um, I work with 25 of the most incredible people. We are spread out across five different countries, headquartered in Philadelphia. And we have built three really amazing products. Uh, and a fourth conveyor is on the way. Beanstalk will turn 10 years old this year. So we've been building SaaS software products for a really long time. But today's story is really about Postmark, which, as Rob said, it's a transactional email service. Um, it's almost seven years old, I think. And what I want to talk about today is not maybe all of our successes, but kind of something scary that happens when you start to grow a business. And that's when you start hitting what I call like a growth plateau. So in 2014, we realized that Postmark's growth rate actually took a pretty nice dive. And as we started to project going forward, we didn't really see a way out. We really just saw a flat line growth. And that was really scary. And we got out of it. And so that's what I'll talk to you about today. But so today I want to talk about fear of missing out. I think as leaders, you all know that focus is the most important thing that you need to be doing. Focus is everything. Everybody will tell you that without focus, you die. But what is it about focus that makes it so hard to find sometimes? What is it that makes focus often so elusive? When you start to grow your business, you realize that you have a lot more options now. You have tons of choices, tons of opportunities, tons of things that you can be doing. Now you have customers, and you have to decide on whether or not you're going to implement the feature that they're asking for. You have competition that is changing direction, launching new features, trying new marketing tactics, and you start to look around and say, is that something I should be doing? Is that for me? Or maybe even a company that you started out with that starts hiring like crazy or gets VC, and you look around and you think, is that for me? Am I missing out on some really, really important opportunity? And so what happens naturally is you start to see all of these choices, all of these opportunities to grow, you start taking on too much. And whether that's individually as a founder, you start creating kind of a mess in your own head, or you create chaos for your team, disrupting them, changing direction, changing the mission, and really, really causing a lot of trouble. Because while growth is all about focus, it's when you start growing that you start really being tempted to lose that focus constantly, constantly. And in 2014, if you would have asked me, is wild bit focused, I would have said, yes, of course, we are so, so focused. We know exactly what we're doing. But now in hindsight, looking back, we realize that we had a tremendous amount of work to do to really find that focus. So today we're going to talk about what I'm calling this like focus framework. These three areas that if you find your way towards focusing them, you'll be able to survive any kind of bump in the road, any kind of plateau, any kind of issue. So what we did is we ended up focusing in three really important areas. We started with focusing on ourselves as leaders, as founders, what it was it that we were supposed to do to grow the product. We defined our company, our business, what, what, why does Wildbit exist? And only then were we able to really define why does Postmark exist and what is Postmark's mission. So in those three ways, we were able to kind of get out of the plateau. So we'll talk about those a little bit today. Chris and I are married, right? So the Number one question that we always get is, how on earth do you work with your spouse and not kill each other? Uh, we've been doing it for a long time, for 13 years, and I think one of the things that works for us is that we're very lucky in that we have very opposite strengths. Chris is super analytical. He's much more technical than I am. I have a great memory. I bring a bigger picture to the table. And so for a long time, we felt like those competing pieces, 
had to be present in every decision. We always had to be involved together in absolutely everything. And as you can imagine, that didn't leave much room for thinking about growing a business. We were so focused in the day-to-day -day and building a product and building a team that we really didn't stop to look around and see what was going on around us. And the market was changing. You know, we've been building products for a long time and the competition <laughs> grows exponentially and if you're not looking, you start to really fall back. And it was only through luck that uh, we have a great friend who introduced us to an advisor. Someone who we hired to come on board to try to help us kind of figure ourselves out. And after he sat, our, sat with us for a little bit, heard our story, first thing he said was, we got to figure out what the hell you two do every day. What is your job here? And so like any successful marriage counselor, he created a very safe environment where we got to share what is it that we're good at individually? What is it that we love to do individually? And probably most critical, what is it that the business needs us to do? Because while we all love to work in only that intersection between what we love to do and what we're really good at, we all want to grow our products too. So it's kind of important that you make sure that that intersects very closely with what the business requires of you right now. And so somewhere in that intersection, in that little sweet spot of those three questions, we made one of the most important changes to, in Wildbit's history. And that was uncovering my role as CEO and Chris's role as CTO. Because now when I wake up every morning, I know exactly what I have to do and where I have to focus. I know that my job is to make sure that the team is happy, that our culture is growing and it's strong. Chris wakes up knowing that he has to make sure that we're building the best product we possibly can. And together as co-founders, right, we still work on figuring out how we grow this business and what we want out of it. But while that work started out to identify what it was that we were supposed to do, what it did in addition was really uncover these gaps Gaps that were created by either things that we really didn't do well or things that we hated to do, or gaps that were created because now in our roles as CEO and CTO, we really needed to focus our attention on certain things and we were not going to have the space to do other things that were really important for the business to grow. And so for us, that turned into a few really key roles. Um, realizing that I have to really focus on the team and kind of the business side of things, I didn't have the time, or I shouldn't be spending the time on really thinking like growth strategically from a marketing standpoint. And that opened up the position for Garrett to join the company. Or as we knew Postmark needed to, uh, we have a big team on Postmark and it needed to have somebody driving the, the, the strategy and the planning and all of that. And Chris couldn't focus on that if he was gonna be thinking more high level strategically on the product. We created, we created a role for Postmark, our very first product manager, and we hired Rian. And I think most interestingly, we all probably sit here and hold on to things that we know really well as founders. And they're like the last thing you delegate, the last thing you let go of, something that you're good at, something that you love to do. And so for us, that was infrastructure. And Chris always kind of, he owned that piece. And so he, that was the intersection for him of between the good, the, what he loves to do and what he's really, really good at. But the business did not need him building servers. And so through a painful process, we created this role of lead systems engineer and hired Alex. And it's made a tremendous impact on his ability, Chris's ability to be able to think higher level on what the products need to do. Because if you think about your role when you start to grow your business, as a founder, as a leader, you need to be focusing on the bigger picture. You have to bring that bigger picture to the table. You're taking in all these different inputs and you're bringing them and you're helping your team guiding them forward. So that means you have to start letting go. And a lot of times that means you need to start hiring people to do things better than you. If you can't trust them to do it better, if you can't let go, then you're probably not hiring the right people and you probably need to find somebody else. Any moment you waste in the day-to-day -day, in things that aren't into that, in that sweet spot, in that intersection of what the business really needs from you, is time that you've wasted and time that you're not really focusing on growing your business. Given that I know we're in a lucky spot that we were able to fill those gaps with people and not everybody's able to do that, I don't think it gives anybody here an excuse to not really understand, spending the time to understand where their sweet spot is. Everybody needs to find what, you know, you work, play to your strengths, find what you're good at, but also really identify the areas that the business needs you to focus on and then find those gaps and work like hell to fill those gaps, whether with people, with software, with whatever you need to be doing, but make sure you don't ignore the areas in your business that you need to be starting to fill. You never want to end up stuck where you don't see the forest from the trees for growth. And even if you, you know, 
big picture, you need to understand where you need to focus as a leader. It starts to bleed into everything, even the little things in your life, like the books you read, right? So I have, I'm sure a lot of you are like this, I have a queue of books that's a mile long, and I, everybody recommends something new, and it's amazing, but I can never keep up. But how do you decide what to read next? You know, do you, how, do you, how do you find the book that you know is going to bring you a lot of value with some critical piece of advice, but you have so many of them? How do you know what to hit next? You have to apply that same kind of understanding. What does the business need from you as a leader right now? And what, what do you need to learn? Where is that wisdom that you need? So in like simple examples, when we were trying to figure out, are we going to stay flat forever? You know, is that important for our company? Well, we, so we took some time and I read, you know, management books, right? I read Turn the Ship Around. I didn't read a marketing book. Or, you know, earlier this year, we, just, we needed to sit down and figure out a strategy, a marketing strategy for Postmark. And we all as a team read this book, Traction. We didn't read about management. And that's not to say that you know, both of those books at different times couldn't have driven, brought value, ideas. We could have moved in different directions. But at the end, we wouldn't have been moving in the direction we needed to for the product to grow now. You have to apply all of that focus to yourself in everything, not just the big strategic decisions, but in all of that stuff to know where your sweet spot is of what you need to be doing as a leader. So... Hopefully you'll define what your job is. And then now the next natural progression is to really define what it is you want out of your business. And here, I want to be clear, I speak of business like capital B. This is not your product. There's a big difference between growing your business and growing your product. Your business is you, your co-founders, your team. And your product is what enables your business to exist. And when you're thinking about growth, it's really important that you s separate those two. There's too many businesses run for a product to grow and not for a business to grow, and that'll get you into a lot of trouble. In the time we've run Wildbit together, Chris and I have talked a bunch about what it is that we want Wildbit to be. But we never really took the time to sit down and write it down. What is Wildbit? Why does it exist? So when we were standing on this, this edge and seeing that Postmark wasn't growing the way it needed to be, we realized we had a ton of options. There's a hundred ways you can grow a product, and probably a lot of them would work. But how do you decide which one is right for you? Do we hire a huge sales team because it's working for other, for other teams, right? We started looking around and people were hiring big sales teams. We, have a high, uh, we can have a high cost of acquisition, so we could do that. Is that for us? Or our competition maybe is supporting products and building features that we aren't doing. Should we do that? How do you decide what it is that you need to do to grow your products if you haven't decided what your business is supposed to be? And that's when we realized that before we could move forward with figuring out how to grow Postmark, we had to define Wildbit first. So we started asking ourselves a lot of questions. How big of a company do we want? Do we want to work 60 hours a week, or is our goal to work three days a week? Do I want to know everybody on my team, their spouse's names, their kids' names, or am I totally cool with an amazing management team that can handle some of that for me and I only manage a smaller group? It's in answering a lot of these questions that we started to define what Wildbit was supposed to be. We knew we wanted to stay close to our team and we wanted to grow sustainably, slowly, which meant not hiring a giant sales team because that's going to be count very counter to what Wildbit was supposed to be. So you all have to answer some set of these questions. You have to define what it is that your business is meant to be. And I'm not judging. Your answers don't have to match mine because... We build businesses all for very, very personal reasons. It's when you're, the only wrong answer is when you're dishonest with yourself. If you don't answer those questions honestly and you don't really honestly define what it is you want your business to be, when you hit a bump in the road, when you have to make a really important decision, you're going to make that decision based on a fear, fear of making the wrong call, fear of, fear of missing an opportunity. You're not going to make the call based on an informed decision of how you have chosen to run your business. And if you can define that, and you should, then my biggest suggestion is to create a support system around you. That advisor that I was telling you about earlier has brought tremendous value to Chris and I. He comes every two months. We pay him for his time. He's got a very different background. He's exited several times. So he brings a lot of really challenging dialogue to the table. We talk about all kinds of things that challenge Chris's, our decisions, our answers to what we want Wildbit to be. I'll ask, why do you run four products? Why don't you just sell them all and just focus on one? Or what's your exit strategy? You know, things that we would naturally not have in conversation. 
But as we keep talking through them and we keep answering them in the same way, we build a confidence that, yes, we are building a business that we want, a business that we're proud of, a business that we'll, you know, we'll smile about in 10, 15 years. And if you can get an advisor, you should also get a great group of friends who run similar businesses to you. This is why conferences like this exist, right? We've found uh, tremendous support in a group of friends whose businesses are some quite significantly bigger than ours. We hang out together, we go on retreats together, they poke holes in all of our ideas, they, you know, we, we compare marketing strategies, we spend a lot of time with people who have been there, and people who are in the trenches, and they know what's going on, and we compare ideas, and again, it helps you kind of solidify your position, your decision in the type of business you want to run. And when you run a business for as long as we have, you get this question all the time, like, how come you haven't raised money? How come there's no VC? And I think it's important to be clear, you know, I know a lot of us are very determined to bootstrap, but venture capital inherently is not bad, is not evil, right? And a lot of companies have used it successfully to escalate growth to very positive outcomes. The problem is that you start to think about that a lot of times before you've defined what type of company you want to run. And so it's when you start thinking about VC before you've defined what it is that you want out of your business that you start really running into and stumbling through and start seeing people make some really bad decisions. So over the years, when we've had venture capital come and at, you know, we've had calls or whatever, like, we've always kind of done this exercise, Chris and I, that I think is really valuable. You sit down by yourself with your co-founders, with whoever's helping you run your business, and individually write down how you would spend a million dollars right now. And you can't buy a nice car as much as I'd love to. You have to take a million dollars and you have to figure out how you're going to make that million dollars make you two. Or depending on your term sheet, maybe 10. But you gotta figure out how, what are you gonna do? How are you gonna make a million dollars work for you? And every time we've done this exercise, we've never been able to come up with that answer. Maybe that's us. We have been building product for a long time and I've never seen a feature turn into a hockey stick. So I could never justify beefing up my, my product team to grow, right? I, I don't know how to do that. And our sales and marketing strategy has never been something that's really formulaic where I could say like dollar in, two dollars out. It's still kind of wishy-washy, you know. And so for us, it never made sense. And if the same thing happens to you and if you go through that exercise and do it often, you might uncover places where you do want to kind of build up maybe one or two more people or maybe cool marketing thing here or there, but if you get to the same place where you can't find a way that you can guarantee to make $2 million, it's probably not, not for you. Because you're sitting here today because you decided to run a business because you wanted to define what type of business you wanted to run. In race car driving, they teach you that you pilot a car. You pilot it by looking where you want to go. If you start looking at a tree or you look at a wall or you look at where you came from, you will end up driving into that tree or into that wall. And in business, it's no different. If you spend the time writing down, really defining what it is that you want out of your business, you will end up going in that direction. And when you hit a bump in the road, whether it's like us, when you hit a plateau or whether somebody acquisition offers, whatever, you will be so confident in your decisions that you won't make a choice based on fear you'll make a decision based on the type of business that you've chosen actively to run. So if you've defined your business, I think only after that moment can you start to think, okay, how am I gonna grow my product? We have built products because we were solving pains. Beanstalk started 10 years ago almost because at managing SVN repositories was a pain and nobody wanted to do it. And so we said, all right, we can solve a problem. We started Postmark because Beanstalk was sending so many emails and we had zero visibility into where they were going. Uh, we, you know, we'd have a support requests, where customers would email us and say, hey, I invited my client, and they never got the email. And we're like, oh, no, no, no. You know, I had no idea, did they misspell it, did it bounce, did they market a spam, we had no idea. So we built Postmark with a pain to solve, right? And you know, we kind of knew we had to focus the product and we always felt like we had a pretty decent focus. And for Postmark, when we launched it, we knew we were going to, our, our niche, our focus was going to be, we were the only transactional, we were the only provider that was going to focus on transactional email. We had run an email marketing product in a previous life that we shut down, and so we knew we didn't want email marketing. We knew that transactional email needed to be di treated differently from marketing email, and so we knew, okay, that's going to be our niche. We're going to be the only one that just does transactional email. And we built a really great product. 
And it worked for us for a while. You know, we were growing, customers loved it, NPS scores through the roof, everything was great. But when we kind of hit this plateau, right, when we realized, like, we don't really know where we're going with this, um, we started to really look internally to see, like, our, what is it? What's going on? And as I mentioned earlier, we started looking at around us, at other companies, what is everybody doing? And one of the scariest moments, because we realized we weren't as focused as we needed to be, was when we started to look at our competition and realizing that marketing emails, the stuff that we were not allowing to be sent through Postmark, was helping all of these companies grow and grow rapidly. And so we were leaving a ton of money on the table, and that was really scary. And so the question came up, like, do we start, do we start sending marketing emails? Even though we knew internally that like, that was our niche, that was how we grew in the first place, how can we just let that go? And the only thing we knew how to do at that point before we made any scary decisions was we started talking to customers. And we started to try to understand why was our MPS score so high? Why did customers love the product so much? And we quickly realized that we weren't actually selling a feature. We were selling a, an infrastructure product that was all about reliability and performance. Our customers are apps who rely on that email to get to the inbox as fast as humanly possible. Email is a core part of their business. And that's why they continue to pick Postmark over and over again. So we, we're a more expensive product. And everybody will tell you in this room, charge more. That's like everybody's favorite thing. Charge more, charge more, charge more. Well, the problem with charging more is you have to have a better product, which, okay, we, had a really, we have a better product. But you also kind of have to sell it like that, right? You can't just say, like, charge more, I promise it's going to be better. And what we started to realize as we were talking to customers, we weren't selling it like that. We weren't really clear on why customers were choosing us over our competition that was less expensive. And so like the light bulb went off and we said, you know what? We just have to sell it better. We have to repackage. We have to focus all of our energy on, sh on sharing, on showing this value proposition to potential customers. And that's what we did. We, the whole team, our single objective for an entire year was being the fastest to the inbox. And that changed everything for us. It dictated product development. We spent time redesigning our status page. And instead of having a simple status page up, down, you know, we said, okay, well, if we're the most reliable and the fastest, then we got to show it. So we posted live stats of not only whether or not we were getting to the inbox, but also how fast we got to the inbox. Nobody did that. We started do, taking sprints to just work on infrastructure stuff, back-end server stuff, things our customers didn't see, which is risky. But we knew that if we focused all of our development, all of our marketing, all of our communication to being the fastest to, to this promise that we had been making, then we would be certainly delivering on this value that we're going to then start to sell. And in 2016, a, a big shift happened in the market. Uh, one of our major competitors made a, made a big decision, uh, made a big strategic decision, and a lot of business started moving around. A lot of clients started moving around. And we started winning a lot of new business. Everything was up. Visits was up, sign-ups, conversions, everything. And we've been able to kind of maintain that, as you can see, <laughs> um, over time. And when we started to evaluate, you know, like when a market shift happens, you don't really control that. So you start to get really nervous, like, is it us or is it just the market changes? We started to really evaluate it and we realized the only reason we were building winning business was not because the market changed. You don't automatically start getting a ton of new customers. We started to win business because we had spent that time zeroing in on that focus of why Postmark was the best product for our, our, our ideal customer. So when people were switching around and trying to find new providers and they came to Postmark's landing page, it said something drastically different than everybody else. We didn't talk about marketing features. We didn't talk about templates. We didn't talk about all this stuff. We talked about being the fastest, most reliable, most performant email service provider that existed. And we backed it up with data. And we continued to win these bets, or win these deals, and as you can see now, um, and it worked. And last year we did like 45% growth, and I think this year we're targeting 55% growth, which is tremendous. I can't handle any more than that. That'll, that'll destroy everything. And it worked. And the coolest thing about when you focus your product's value prop, your mission, you really just keep focusing it, is even your customers start talking the way you want them to be. We started seeing tweets and conversations from customers saying things like, use Postmark when your email matters. Or when you care about email, you can only use Postmark. Or send your crappy email that you don't care about through a cheaper provider, but the good stuff, send the good stuff through Postmark. You know, it like, worked. And there's something so exciting about being able to like, 
grow a bit, grow, change something like that, change direction, really focus. We spent a year focusing on this and to see it actually turn into something really spectacular. And it was pretty exciting. So I, I come here today with a, a, a framework. I don't have any growth hacking tips for you guys. I think we're going to get more into that over the next two days. But I come here with something that I think will sustain you for a long time if you just always remember that you have to continue to focus in these three places. Anytime you get lost, anytime you stumble, as a leader, as a founder, you will always be just, there will be things vying for your attention. And you have to constantly, constantly bring yourself back to what is it that I need to be doing right now? What am I good at? Play to your strengths, but what does the business need for me? And then figure out where those gaps are. Don't let those gaps stay open for a long time because you will see that you will start veering off course. And it's in those gaps a lot of times that are the, the ways in which you start to grow your business and where you start to really making that forward progress, that one slow, slow step in front of the other. And then make sure that you constantly define that business. And it, it, gets cha it changes, right? Keep asking yourself those questions. But define it so you know that you're doing it for the right reasons. Define what you want to be building so that in five years and 10 years, you're proud of where you're co you've come. If that means you stay close to your team or you don't, those, the, the answers don't really matter. Just make sure you know that you're honest with yourself on why you're in this for the first place. It's okay to want to flip a business, but just be, be you know, don't pretend that you're trying to do something else. And only then, when you've really honestly defined why your business exists, can you then spend the time to focus on, okay, now how am I going to grow this product? Because the options are endless. There's not going to be one answer. Don't follow what you read on the internet. We all build software products, but for very different audiences. And you can't forget that your audience is different. We joke around that that group of friends that we hang out with um, very often, they, you know, we all built software, we all been in business for at least 10 years. And we were on a retreat a little bit ago, and everybody's doubling down or tripling down on content. It's working, and it's a content, content, higher content, people, three pieces a week. Chris and I are sitting there like, oh, I just don't want that, right? Now, it doesn't mean that content won't work for us, but we decided instead of content, we're actually here. We're, our entire marketing strategy this year is conferences and making personal connections. I don't know if it'll work, it might fail, but at least I've defined who I want Wildbit to be, and that marketing strategy for growing Postmark fits into that definition of what we want out of a business. And so there's a million options. Read that book, Traction. It's great. It'll walk you through 19 different options. And some of them, a lot of them will work. But defining the one that works for you because it fits your business and it fits what you want to be doing is where, you're, where you'll get excited. You don't want to grow a product doing things that somebody else told you to do. You want to grow a product because it feels good and it's right and it makes you proud of the way in which you kind of, you made your money, you grew your business. So with that, thank you guys. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, you, you mentioned you did all this work on improving in infrastructure and reliability and performance, and then uh, the market shifted around. And I was just wondering how that picture would have looked if, the mar if that competitor hadn't left the market and what, uh, like, did you, did you have a, a strategy in place if that hadn't happened or, or, or how you would have handled that? I think we would, so we've maintained like a very positive trend on everything, signups, visits, all of that stuff. So I think the theory is that it would have been a slower ramp up. So, I mean, basically when Mandrill made a big sh change, it was, I mean, it was a free for all, right? And so one of the big things is like, you, you in injected the market with a bunch of new people shopping around that weren't normally be shopping around, right? So they come out, like that market continues to grow, but it was just a kind of like a ramp like this, and then it kind of slowed down, and then it kept going like that. So I think it would have continued. It just probably would have been a slower direction because, like I said, every time a new person came to the site, they had such a different message on the landing page, and so like they self-identified that that was the product for them. And I just think it would have been a slower. We wouldn't have had like that like a big shift in kind of early 2016, it would have just like flattened out a little bit. I'm coming for you, Charles. So you talked a little bit about building the business you want, and in particular, 
um, finding the people who didn't, who could fill roles that didn't put you in that sweet spot that you match up in. And there are definitely areas like that in my business, but I'm not sure that I'm in a position to hire for all of those positions. So how do you prioritize which one you build and how long do you keep doing the things that aren't in the sweet spot before you decide, okay, I can actually afford to and afford the time to train somebody to fill that position? I think it, I mean, I, I don't know your business, but I would imagine there's probably ones that are glaringly really important and ones that aren't. And, you know, whether you, you're going to stay in them, right? I'm sure there's things that are in our speed spot now that in a year I'm going to tell you that we can't do that anymore. You know, like as the business kind of evolves, that's a constantly shifting thing. But I would, I would say the way we've always done it is we've maybe not, in a less formal way, always looked at like what's the priority for growing it right now. And so if that's marketing, for example, maybe it's just part-time, maybe it's finding a, I mean, there's, maybe it's software, I don't know, but it depends on like what that piece is, but if, you're doing some finance stuff and it's not taking up a ton of your time, keep doing it. You know, don't like go hire a CFO right now. But if it's when it starts to really take up too much of your time, I would start, start suggesting like to start moving that out and however you can get creative. Hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> Just looking over there. Uh, have you measured, so once you put uh, the uh, information about you being the fastest to the inbox on your landing page, have you measured how many uh, customers kept asking for more templates and other things on top of you being the fastest? Measured, no. Uh, or like, have you have you tracked? I mean, informally probably, yeah. But I mean, consistently the that's a secondary thing to, okay, this is a priority for me, and then, oh, by the way, do you have you know, a templating system or whatever? But again, because we focus on transactional only, we actually can skirt a lot of that stuff because we don't do marketing. So like, uh, nobody asks for A-B testing and things like that. So we are able to really focus our feature set on being the most performant, the most reliable, and we don't have to worry about some of that other stuff. Hey, Natalie. Hi. Hello. So uh, I feel like running one business and growing them is tough enough. How do you manage four, <laughs> and how do you stay focused on all of them, or you know, focus your team on all four of them? Are you planted? Because Garrett really wanted this to be part of my talk. Um, well, not easily. Uh, so I think um, our, our products have all evolved over time and, and started in various phases. So they all have different kind of needs. They're like kids, right? Like they all have different requirements in their ages. Um, we for the last five or six years have created dedicated teams to each one. So the plan is really like Amazon runs multiple, runs multiple products, right? Like or anybody, right? We try to find those teams that are dedicated, have a single priority, single objective, and they kind of work in, in kind of autonomous groups. And then they have their own goals, their own missions. And then Chris and some of the kind of leadership team, we focus on kind of making sure that they're moving in the right direction. But it's not without its challenges for sure. But they have different phases, you know, Postmark's like a really active growth phase. We're building a new product, so that's, you know, a totally different beast. And so I think that helps a lot. If we had all four in the exact same state of being and all needed the exact same thing, I think we would never be able to succeed in that. Hi, so you, one, of the things you had, uh, uh, one of the things you had mentioned was, all right, one of the things you had mentioned was that you're, uh, you're, you had to ask whether, why the customer is buying your premium product. So how did you go about figuring that out? And what was, like you mentioned, that obviously you did some things, but uh, how did you figure out what to do? So, sorry, say that again, premium. Okay. So you, like, you said that you were charging more than others, and you went to, like, why was a customer buying your product? Right. And uh, uh, you, you said that you, you went through that discovery phase and then repositioned your product in some way and invested in, in it. Right. So what was that process like? So we, our pricing hasn't changed over the years. So like we weren't the most expensive when we launched. And then as you know, the race of the big VC back companies kind of raced to the bottom, like pricing got much cheaper. And we always said like in order to maintain the business that we want to run, I don't want to run a product that's that cheap. I need too big of a company to be profitable. So we were always looking at pricing and always very conscious of the fact that we're more expensive and that's a very scary place to be in. But as long as the product Pro delivered on the promises that we were making, 
customers will continue to buy. So we, when we started talking to customers and trying to understand, and potential customers trying to understand what, why it was they were looking at Postmark, pricing never came up. So that was kind of the, how we knew that like the value we were delivering, they weren't worried about, we're not like cost prohibitive, we're just a little bit more expensive. So the conversation about pricing actually never comes up in conversations, or very rarely comes up in conversations. So we knew that pricing wasn't the area we had to focus on. We had to focus on making sure we continued to market and sell the product as a premier, like the, the best service for those types of customers who are willing to pay for it. Uh, so I can struggle with coming up with the, you know, the thought experience, experiments of like defining what kind of business I want and what kind of product I want. So were you able to leverage your existing team? Um, you know, not just your husband, but your entire team. Were you able to like use them to sort of help you through those mental experiments? Yes, we're a very um, close team, like especially strategically, like we all work together. Uh, we also build products for developers or for, for other web apps. So like our team is our audience a lot more than maybe sometimes Chris or I are our audience. So we do a lot of that strategic thinking together. And um, you know, it's an all group effort, success is involved, everybody's involved to really think through and say like, what is it that makes us, you know, the product that it is? And then we kind of work through all of that together as a team. Did that answer your question? Okay, cool. Do we have any other questions for Natalie? I think we have time for maybe one more. I'm just wondering if you could talk a bit about the new product you guys are coming out with, not specifically the product, but the, the process around coming up with it, deciding to actually go forward. I mean, I'm sure a lot of us in this room have one product and then four that we'd like to launch. Right. Um, so Beanstalk's turning 10 this year, and so uh, Conveyor is actually our next iteration on Beanstalk. Um, we sat down a couple years ago when you know, we compete against really, really big companies. We always have, for some reason, that's just always been what we did, and so um, maybe three or four years ago we sat down and talked about like, the next, what Beanstalk is supposed to be, like how do we keep going? And when you're competing against GitHub and Bitbucket and GitLab, it's very basically like features. You know, like you're just going to build more features. And so we didn't really want to be in that business. And so that wasn't bringing us a tremendous amount of excitement on the team. Like there wasn't this energy like, just build more features, like build CI, build, you know, build all this stuff. And so we said like, what, if we were to build Beanstalk today, and 10 years is a long time, so like if we were to build a product today, what would it look like? And we all were in agreement that it would not look like Beanstalk. Like we wanted to be able to start fresh because we have hundreds of thousands of users, you can't just like flip the switch and turn it into something completely different, especially when it works so well for our existing customer base. So we kind of decided that like, to do it in a way that we're proud, to do our customers proud, we needed to start over and we needed a fresh slate. And so we started completely rethinking from everything. It's not a web app, it's actually a, a Mac client, um, or a Mac app with a web app piece, because we really just wanted to say like, how do we, forget everything we know. Well, not everything we know, forget everything we built and take everything that we know and how would we improve that process for development teams for our type, you know, our, our customer. And that's kind of how we got to it. And it's been two and a half years. <laughs> Don't build a Mac app if you haven't done it before. It's really hard, yeah. I think we actually have time for one more. If there's another question. Uh, hey, Natalie. Um, we actually are a user of your customer. Uh, sorry, we're a user of your product, awesome. uh, Postmark, for quite some time. Awesome. I was interested you said that part of your, your process about figuring out who you, who, what Postmark does was you went and talked to your customers, but you didn't talk to, you didn't talk to me. <laughs> 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 but, uh, but, but my serious question, though, is that like, I'm probably like a, one of the silent majority of your customer base. What, what process did you go through to actually talk to those customers? Uh, very rudimentary, just started talking to people. Um, the, su the support team, actually one of the, um, the most transformative conversations happened not with a customer. Chris and I were at a conference four years ago, I guess, and we're having a conversation with somebody who was using a competitor, um, and he was talking about all the pain he was feeling. A huge product, they were selling um, MP3s of like other, I forget the name of the app, but anyway, they were selling like, um, Music, video, uh, music videos and music downloads of like big famous uh, musicians and 
they would have like all this trouble with the emails not arriving and what that would generate for them is like tons of support. I mean, you have to think like the thing with transactional email is like if I bought a license and it didn't show up when I clicked on the Gmail tab, like I'm emailing support, right? I'm not sitting around and waiting two minutes, four minutes for it. I assume something broken, I'm emailing support. And so this, we were talking to this founder and he was telling us this whole story. He's like, I pay anything in the world to just know that those emails, because it's critical to my business, are getting where they need to go. And I remember Chris and I walked like the two and a half miles back instead of taking a cab because we were like, oh shit. Like that there's something there, right? And then, so then we started validating that and talking to customers. We were NPS, we used like NPS scores, we used Delighted, started seeing a lot of that stuff. And so it started to kind of really formulate. I can't say we use very formal processes at all at Wild, but it's just not really been our thing. Thanks again, Natalie. Yeah, thank you guys.